Hi, good morning. Um, as you saw from the program, my name is Amelia Santos Paulino. I am from ONTAC, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, and for me it's very very symbolic to be here. I was a, a fellow at UNUI there for six years before joining UNCTAD. And since then, uh, we have managed to keep a good partnership. And thanks to Kunal's support, uh, who has been uh, basically backing up and giving us the space and also supporting our policy and academic work. Today we have a different panel from all the academic panels you have. I will be presenting the main uh, results of the War Investment Report, the Think Chapter, which is the International Taxation and Development. Then we will have uh, the best possible policy and academic mix panel. First we will have the discussant, uh, Professor Juka Pirtala from UNU Wider and also from the University of Helsinki. Also I am very pleased to have today and thank you so much uh, for supporting us uh, uh, Luis Ignacio Lozano from the Central Bank, the Bank of the Republic. He's the Director of Research and finally we have Kunal Sen uh, wrapping up with the development discussions. Yesterday somebody asked me, we were having coffee and asked me, where are you from, what are you doing here? And uh, when I said I am from that uh, the person asked, what is your link with inequality then? And then I thought to myself, well, if by now we don't know that trade and investment have direct links on within and between countries inequality, we are in trouble. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I would like to say that my presentation today will not cover all the report. Uh, the War Investment Report is the flagship publication of the United Nations Systems on Investment and Development. It has the usual trends chapter that looks at um, investment trends, different types of <coughs> cross-border investment trends, also policy trends. And since 2019, the United Nations General Assembly through a resolution uh, designed on that to also analyze the impact of international investment, both upstream and downstream on sustainable development. And then every year we have a theme, a theme related to investment and development. And this year we work on the theme of the impact of the international tax reform, that is the OECD G20 Pillar 2, uh, BEPS 2, which calls for the introduction of a minimum tax on multinational enterprises of 25%. So my, the core of my discussion and then the panelists will focus on this aspect of the report. Before we go into the topic, if you give me three minutes, I would like to present you some important trends uh, on foreign direct investment because I think that will help to con contextualize why this reform matters and what are the, pos the possible uh, developmental implications. I have a declaration, uh, a disclaimer to make. The report and the reason why UNCTAD uh, goes into this topic is because of the implications that that will have on developing countries and on investment policies. We do not do distributional assessment and we don't, do not do distributional impact. We look at the impact of foreign direct investment and what might be the implications for developing countries' investment policies. So just quickly here, this is our standard opening figure of the World Investment Report. We saw that the pandemic hit foreign direct investment flows as other important economic variables hardly. 2021 was a year of recovery. FDI recovered. 64% from the pre-pandemic level, sorry, from the post-pandemic level in 2020. This recovery happens across the world, both developed and, de develop and developing countries, but the growth was higher in developing countries due to the loose financial conditions that multinational benefit from, from the support during the period of pandemic, and also through high reported retained benefits. And what happens, these high report benefits were not invested in productive sectors. There was a high, uh, uh, an increase in intra firms, uh, financial transactions, mostly uh, mergers and acquisitions. So yes, positive, positive developments, but not necessarily it implied more productive investment for developing countries. Also the global environment changed with the war in Ukraine. Uh, that also ref was reflected in investor sentiments. We do analysis of uh, expected profits of multinationals and all revised the expected profits downward, except for those operating in the oil and gas sector. 
again with important implications on top of the food and fuel crisis. Across the world, I mean, the, we saw that developed and developing countries uh, had a positive, uh, a positive uh, a recovery from uh, from the impact of the pandemic. Um, here we see that developing countries benefit, especially because of strong performance in in Asia, a partial recovery in Latin America, and a rebound in in Africa. So this is again welcoming. Just quickly, and I will not go into this because we will need another, another conference for this. Uh, as I said, we are mandated to analyze the impact of foreign direct investment or all cross investment on sustainable development. This is just an analysis we do, looking at cross-border, uh, what is called greenfield investment, the intentions of uh, investors, and project finance, which is a very important mechanism because basically it uh, is investment into big projects that developing countries cannot afford to undertake alone. So basically, there was a decline on investment across all SDG sectors. These are not the 17 SDGs. These are in investment-related sectors of the Sustainable Development Goals. The only increase that we observed was in renewable energy. This is a boom that we also saw within regions, especially Latin America, and, and but also in Europe and developed countries. And in education, there was a, a rebound, but not necessarily in the all aspects of education of the of the goal. It was basically big infrastructure projects in in some countries. So, yes, FDI increased mostly financial transactions between enterprise, high return earnings, and then the discussion on why taxation matters becomes relevant. So now we move to the to the core, the thin chapter of the report and the discussions that we're going to have uh, today. So what is the impact of the BEPS, this new reform to international taxation on global, uh, on global FDI? Some of you that are uh, expert, I am not an expert in taxation, I am part, I am the chief of investment research and I am part of the core team of the World Investment Report. We had a team of experts working with us. We had Michael King, ex-IMF, and also from the Institute of Fiscal Studies uh, uh, in London. We had some experts from the Vienna Tax Institute. So it was a team of scholars working with us doing this analysis. And again, our entry point is the impact of FDI and what will be the impact on policy. So just quickly, what do we need to worry? Why I am here at the development conference talking about the global minimum tax? There are three many aspects that we cover in the report. And yesterday we had a fantastic policy panel that touched on some issues related to the development impact. One, the reform is transformational. It will reshape the international investment landscape because it affects the larger multinationals which invest in developing countries through their foreign affiliates. Second, it is pervasive. It involves more FDI and countries than it seems. And finally, it is concrete, already signed. Uh, implementation is expected to the, for the end of 2023, 2024. Switzerland, the country where I, where I am posted, already called for a referendum, where, but other countries that sign are a bit concerned about what it will imply for their uh, fiscal uh, promotion, uh, for the tools for fiscal uh, and for investment attraction. So, what we uh, did uh, while we were preparing the report, we did a survey of investment promotion agencies, which are our focal point in tandem with the ministries of trade, to see what was the level of awareness among developing countries. 141 countries signed already, mostly of them uh, G20 plus developing countries. So surprisingly, ministries of trade or ministries of finance knew because processes through the uh, OECD, but the level of awareness in the institutions that facilitate investment, promote investment, was very low. So that is a, an issue when we think about technical assistance, technical cooperation, and the level of preparedness of developing countries to implement this reform. And then the big question to the panel, especially to Kunal, what are the development implications? And we will come back to that. So uh, as I said, um, I mean, we live in a global economy that is characterized by, you know, by Econ 101, by mobile capital, mobile trade. And in this world, we have to be realistic. Corporate tax policies can affect multiple aspects of the global investment. 
it, it affects the location, it affects the distribution, and it and also affects how countries design their tax system. So these are the aspects that we look into the report. So the core of this reform uh, affects what is called large multinationals, defined not by the number of employ employment, but by the by the, the capital, the annual revenue. So the cutoff point was 750 million. This leaves small multinationals out of the of the scope of the reform. I invite you to look at the first chapter of the of the report where we started to look at internationalization of SMEs via FDI, not only export and investment by small enterprises is still small and is in decline. So this is mostly large MEs investing in developing countries. Then the scope uh, is 15 percent. There is potential downward pressure on new investment by multinationals after this coming into, into place. And then the issue for many countries is the special economic zones regime. Again, it was discussed last night. What it will imply for countries that depend on these special, uh, special areas of production that relied on corporate tax incentives. So these are the issues that we look into the report. So in terms of the, I will not go into the technicality because it will take a, a long time, but the unit of analysis, what we analyze is the effective tax rate paid by foreign affiliates of large MEs. And what we see that on average, effective tax rate is 19%, six points below the average statutory tax rate. So MEs pay effectively less tax than what the country statutory, statutory tax rate um, uh, implies, which comes into the discussion the issue of profit shifting. I mean, what happens is that these foreign affiliate, they don't reinvest the earnings, they shift the profits to uh, of, offshore financial center back to the um, back to the to the home country or other mechanisms that uh, might be in place. So we cannot be naive. I mean, we have to look beyond the statutory tax rate. We know that countries offer other f uh, fiscal incentives, especially those uh, related to the corporate to their corporate tax bill. Uh, some of the, the, the things that we look at was the tax holidays, the deductions and credits, We sometimes are used and abused by multinationals to sort of uh, and affect the, uh, this effective rate, that's why this effective rate is, is lower. So what we did was we used country by country reporting. It's very, as we know, those that work with micro data, it's very difficult to, to find firm level, firm level data. So we used country by country reporting data. And then we computed at the country level what is this effective tax rate, tax rate. And then we did some grouping average for the sake of looking at developing country impact. Our analysis covers 208 countries, of which 53 are developed countries and 155 developing. And also we look at the, or what we call offshore financial centers, because they are the ones that stand to lose when the reforms come in. I mean, this is what this uh, reform is about, to avoid profit shifting and to redistribute this income into the host country. Easier saying that done, as Juca will be telling us later. Um, so, also something important that came out from our analysis is that differences, differences in statutory rates remain one of the most important factors in explaining the variation in this effective tax rate. So we had to be very careful when we generalize, but we try to be, to have a sort of clean analysis and try to normalize as much as possible for these, these variations. But in general, key, note, uh, key message is that this statutory rate is way below the, sorry, the effective rate is way below than the statutory rate. Then uh, before we went into the analytical framework, we also the, tried to understand what is the corporate investment uh, and the fiscal tools used. And as we can see here, most of the instruments are based on corporate income tax. This is many of the countries rely on corporate income tax uh, over the last the, over the last decade, and that uh, represents 
over 49% of all incentives granted to multinationals. So the, the bulk of the reform is this corporate in, uh, uh, income tax. There are other instruments that will have to become part of the financial incentive package once this reform comes into place, especially those related to royalties, innovation, and other non-financial incentives. Uh, there are two issues also important here that we consider during the analysis. One is the analysis based on expenditure or capital investment base, and the other, the what they call the investment, al uh, investment allowance, depreciation, and other type of very boring uh, financial analysis, but again, that there is where multinational can mask some of the some of the these profit shifting uh, numbers. But all in all, the bulk of the reform falls into this CIT, this corporate income tax base. Uh, it doesn't matter if we look at capital, at uh, losses, profit. At the end of the day, the impact will be will be significant. At the time, uh, then I mean this is sort of complement to what I said earlier. Um, and as I show, the effective tax rates are lower than the statutory rates, and uh, less. I mean, our main concern is developing countries, and here we can see that less than a third of developing economies report an average effective tax rate below 15 percent. So. This is the rate that we are very, I mean, we are trying to see what will be the, the shifting uh, mechanism of pillar two. So pillar two is here. So we have that around 37% of countries, uh, the share of developing countries with uh, higher effective tax rate that will have to adjust to that reduced ta taxes is, uh, I mean, we have between 37 and 20%. Again, this is a, an issue that you have to be put on the table when the, the Inclusive Framework Committee comes to, the con, uh, comes to the table and discuss how this is going to be implemented. So in this case, what we did also, I mean, this figure, uh, what, we, what we tried to do was not to look just ratios of taxes paid, but also how they compare to the FDI stock in developing countries, because at the end of the day, this is the, the, the outcome that we are concerned about. Uh, moving on, because I'm conscious of time. So here there are two aspects. One is what is going to be the impact on FDI, and then what is the the make, how it will impact the profit shifting, which is the main uh, channel um, of concern. So again, we saw that there is a difference between developing and developed countries in terms of the effective tax rate. And we incorporate this co profit shifting dynamic because basically this is what overstates the actual taxes paid. <laughs> so in general, we see that the share of developing countries, as we saw before, with rates below 15%, if we look at what is the, the, what is the profit shifting increases. So basically, this is the, the, the part that we are concerned about. What is the, the, I mean, how is this profit shifting is going to, to be curved and is going to return to, uh, to the countries. Um, in general, we see, as I said before, this is what we're worried. I mean, this is the countries that fall below or uh, above the, the reform, and what will be the adjustment, the adjustment level. And when we look at the incentives granted, what we call this curve out, this is mostly the, the area of concern, especially countries that rely on special economic zones and, and so on. So when we consider this profit shifting, then this is the best distribution that, that, we can, that we can have. So again, this is the core of the pillar two. This, uh, these countries that pay these taxes and MEs with these revenues. Okay, so what is the implication of all this? Uh, this is sort of summarized what we saw in the figures. So we see that MEs pay more 
uh, average increase in the corporate income tax on FDI globally lies between 15 and 20 percent. Latin America, the range is between 12 and 22 percent. And most of the increase in this will be due to the uh, profit uh, shifting mechanism. So this is what we want to tackle. 65% globally, and in Latin America, the profit shifting mechanism is 90%. And again, it's because mo the nature of most of the productive uh, system. According to our analysis, the conservative range of the impact of FDI will be FDI during the period of adjustment will increase between 2 and 3%. This is on top of any structural or uh, chocks, structural variables or chocks that might be experimented. Then this will affect the location's decisions of, um, of m and Now the competition will not be based on taxes. There will be other criteria, especially when, it's called, um, when it comes to, the, to investing in developing countries. There will be diversion from low to high tax countries. And we see that the tax rate differential will decrease between 15 and 30%, this differential between these two types of, of countries. And we expect that the, in terms of fiscal revenues, developing countries are expecting to, expected to gain between 1, 1.5, and 3% of FDI. And Latin America, this lies between 1 and 2%. So there will be an adjustment, negative adjustment through FDI, but possibly a positive uh, through, through government revenues. We expect that government, are expected to, government revenues are, are expected to increase. We the analysis uh, that, uh, according to, to our data, we see that uh, the increase will be around 20% of corporate income tax, but developed economies will gain more, around 30% than developing countries. And of course, the idea is that offshore of financial centers will lose. I don't have the number from the top of my head, I'm still jet lag, but the OECD calculated the, what, the, what is the called the fiscal sacrifice, the loss of all countries because this profit shifting mechanism and it was in the billion. So this is a welcome news if this uh, can be tackled. Again, my question, the question that remains through my presentation is that how this will be redistributed to developing countries. So as I said before, I mean, it's, uh, this, this transformation, this reform is pervasive because it involves more FDI and country that it seems. We know that it affects large multinationals and their foreign affiliates living um, SMEs uh, before, but it's not, here we cannot think about firms, the FDI by large F uh, SMEs, and I will show you later how important it is. It's in the range of over 60% of uh, greenfield investment. Uh, Apparently, it affects only the 141 jurisdiction, but we have to remember that we live in a GBC war where MNEs have foreign affiliates in countries that have signed and countries that have not signed the reform. So it will affect all the countries. I mean, some countries will not be able to avoid it. And as we saw, it will not affect only the low tax country, it will affect also the, the countries above the threshold because they will have to adjust to lower the tax rates. And, uh, the, so basically, this, this is a global, a general equilibrium and a global impact. So I earlier mentioned that we focus on an analysis on effective tax rate measured through different weights. And the most important is FDI stock. So basically, these are the three channels that we look. The volume of FDI, what will be the impact of the volume, the distribution, and the route, whether there is profit shifting um, or not. So here. I mean, this is basically summarized uh, more or less what, what we say. And these three are the three core outcomes that we look, like, uh, that we look at, at, the, at, the, um, at the analysis. So basically, the aim is to host countries. We'll, I mean, we look at the host country effective ta tax rate, and the aim is to reduce profit shifting. I mean, this is the, 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 the core of the analysis. And then. There are concerns also what will imply to the cost and also the volume of productive investment in the medium term. Then we look at the other aspects of the differentials, uh, what, uh, what I already explained. I mean, the chapter has all the technicality in boxes, and there are references to the work of uh, others like King that were used as background for this study. 
So in terms of the of the of the impact, I already mentioned that the profit shifting is the main concern, is the critical driver of the reform. This is why the G20 came to the OECD. Some of us might remember that BEPS 1, the original BEPS, the aim was to tackle the digital MNEs because they have a complete uh, footprint, completely different footprint than normal multinationals. Their development impact is <laughs> zero, sometimes negative. So BEPS 2 went beyond multi, uh, the digital MNEs to, to, to look at all the, uh, all, the, all the enterprises. So here these trends confirm what I already, uh, what I already said. And um, for each exposition, what we did was the composition was made assumption of full reversal of profit shifting. I mean, that was the main assumption, full reversal of the profits in the upper bound. All profits shifted um, pre-pillar two are then simply reassigned to the host country where they are generated. So hopefully this profits will come to developing countries. What the mechanism is not clear yet. Uh, again, we try to see how uh, this is going to be applied. And, and again, we look at the importance of this mechanism. If you see in Africa, in all developing countries, 91% uh, Latin America, 96%. So this profit shifting mechanism is really a, a, an important issue for policymakers. Again, uh, in terms of another, another level of impact that we looked at, it was that uh, we look at how the corporate income tax rate uh, on FDI will be, will be affected, and uh, the increase will be more or less by 2 percentage points on, on average. So VEX Pillar 2 will increase the corporate income tax faced by MNEs on the foreign profits, as we already have said many times. The estimated increase in the effective tax rates by MNEs is conservatively estimated uh, because, as I said, there are many different, there, is, there are many variations in statutory rates and other intrinsic uh, characteristics of the countries. And then this will imply an increase by the tax paid by MNEs in developing countries by 15%. And that those will be affected, directly affected by, by the reform. So this is the growth that we expect um, on the rates, the adjustment after pillar two is implemented. Um, I mean, our base, baseline scenario places the potential downward, uh, as I said, on minus 2%, the downward pressure on FDI. But this refers to productive investment only. This do, does not account what is uh, equity or the financial transactions between multinationals. And uh, this is another, another story. And I mean, this is important because as we saw, there is a long history of a very important financial component of FDI. But in our case, we are concerned about productive investment. The flip side of this, as we said, is that the potential that more pressure on investment, uh, the, the impact or the negative impact of FDI, but there will also be a reduction in the tax differences between countries, reducing tax competition. However, all the benefits will not be automatic, and this is where the big question to uh, scholars and policymakers lie. Uh, I mean, in a world where we have a smaller tax base and a smaller tax improvements in other investments determinant is important. Here we are going to compete about fundamentals, country fundamentals, including those related to the infrastructure, the governance, the institutional environment of the countries. Um, I mean, this complements what, what we said before. Again, this is what we call the carve-out effect. The foreign affiliates of the multinationals affected because this is, I mean, this is what developing country grants. I mean, it's a tax break within this range. Uh, so the diversity of tax incentives in the system implies that the impact of the report will fall unevenly across developing countries and firms. And again, uh, here, this is, uh, this is a sort of ideal, ideal world, and we try to see how other incentives 
could be affected what the impact is minimal. I mean, we say because they basically all the exemptions, reduced rate, deductions are less important than the actual tax break and, and, and any, any holidays. So any realistic distribution curve that implies some, bar some variance uh, of effective tax rate will lead to greater impact than the assumption of a uniform country level effective tax rate. So this is how it might look. And uh, I will say it 100 times again, this is the concern when we sit with uh, finance ministers and policymakers, uh, how to make up for this with other, with other incentives. Just quickly uh, wrapping up. So again, this relates to the, I mean, here the orange is the, uh, what to say, the highly affected and the green, not much affected. So basically, this is the part that will be more affected in the reform. Many countries, developing countries, don't use that much this type of incentive. So when the reforms are, are discussed, these are the issues that they will have to, to consider. So in terms of the impact on national investment policy and then how that might overlap to development, investment pro like investment promotion agencies uh, will have to rethink the standard policy tool kills alongside the trade ministries, labor ministries, and, and so on. So again, another co the main constituency of concern for many developing countries, especially in Africa and Latin America, is the presence of special economic zones and uh, that relied on this type of investment package. In the report, we tried to do a sort of guide of how, what policymakers could do to plan for a fiscal reform in this, in this setting. Uh, something that I mentioned earlier is that this analysis and the, the bulk, I mean the core of the reform is foreign investment, productive investment. So what we did, we tried to look at what share of greenfield investment it will be affected by, by this reform and greenfield undertaken by these large m &Es. and in developing countries will be 70% of productive investment. Africa 73%, 72 Latin America, 68 in, in Asia Pacific. Again, this is um, an issue for discussion in terms of what it will imply for the, the financing of uh, develop, developing productive capacities and sustainable development goals in developing countries. Uh, then, when we think about the fiscal reform, adjusting the, the toolkit, what are the key insights that we can give to developing countries? I mean, this is, we try to see it and, and see what is the core of this inclusive framework? What is outside, what is inside? So we need to look at the investment that needs rethinking in countries not endorsing pillar two, because they will be affected indirectly. So we know that countries affected that sign the agreement have to reform the fiscal, uh, the fiscal regimes. Those that did not side, do not have that pressure, but through the issue of foreign affiliates and intra-firms uh, uh, relationship, they will be affected. So the most obviously will be those that are part of the inclusive framework agreement, and uh, they find that many, many host countries will be subject to this uh, adjustment even if they don't, if they don't sign the agreement. Um, so countries that are, have not endorsed agreement, they think that the reform will not buy them but uh, because they are outside of the reform. But as I said, due to the, the relationships between intra-firms, intra, intra firms, that will be, they will be affected uh, partially. Also, the effects of such countries are indirect. We cannot mes measure them directly because they don't fall into the reform. And uh, we cannot look how that would affect the profit shifting. So that is also another complication of the analysis that uh, it will have to be solved uh, in, an, in addition to the, to the policies. So tax competition is blunted but not ended because some countries did not sign and they will likely take new forms. The tax competition will, will take new forms and, and, and new shape. So these are the main, the main concerns, how to adjust this fiscal investment policy uh, uh, to, uh, toolkits. I mean, this is an issue that uh, we try to do some work on, on regional tax cooperation, uh, cooperation and also the complication that international investment agreement bring to these landscapes. 
countries have already signed bilateral and international uh, investment treaties that contradict some of the experts of the reform. So that is an issue that is not clearly articulated and some countries will have to look at what to do, what to do with that. So what are the, the key recommendations that we can make to the international community as a knowledge base but as a policy institution is that we need to scale up technical assistance to developing countries and not only from the UN side but also from the BEPS G20 inclusive framework side. Um, we need to adopt a multilateral solution because as I said this investment dispute settlement mechanism is complicated. In a world where you have on top of free trade agreements you have investment uh, bilateral investment treaty that might complicate the, the application of, of the reform. And finally, what we call a stopgap measure. We need to establish a mechanism that to, will return those, in, those revenues raised by developed countries, the home countries of MNEs, to go back to the host country of the MNEs. And especially countries that were not able to raise those taxes because of technical capacity. So this is a, a stopgap measure is also one of the issues that is under discussion in terms of the inclusive framework with the uh, G20 and the, and the OECD. So general message before we, we open the, the panel discussion. Both developed and developing economies are expected to benefit substantially for increased revenue collection. For developing countries it will be more complicated. Offshore financial centers are stand to lose, especially part uh, a substantial part of the corporate income tax collected. And uh, for smaller developing countries, which generally have lower f a statutory and effective tax rates, the application of this top of tax could make a major difference in revenue collection. But again, we go back to the first point of the technical capacity uh, to do this. So all in all, FDI, the impact will not be, the conservative will be, an 2% decrease in FDI, the adjustment will be of income will be between 15 30%. Developing countries stand to benefit, but developed countries as we stand today, the status quo is that they will benefit more. And then the, the impact of development, this is the question that I pose to the, to the panel now. With this, I stop, I come back with the discussion and thank you very much for your attention.